going to kind of jump into the slides here. Um, you know, by way of short introduction, and I think Christian already covered most of this, but my name is Craig McKenzie. I'm a principal consultant with OnTrax Consulting. I have over 17 years experience of, uh, with implementing Maximo and over that time have five key points that I want to cover during this um, presentation. But obviously, first off, you know, what is an assessment? And, and maybe more specifically, what's a Maximo assessment? I think most of the people that are, you know, attending this, you guys have, um, you know, Maximo implementations and, and obviously the focus of this is a Maximo assessment and, you know, kind of the varieties and usage of that. Um, you know, I, I obviously need to touch on why, you know, why would you even perform an assessment in the first place, so I'll cover that, as well as the different types of assessments that uh, we um, I'll also cover in pretty good detail, I think, kind of the areas to target for an assessment. So if you are going to proceed and, and do your own assessment or hire externally, whatever you prefer, um, you know, what are some of the areas that you would typically be targeting specifically in that assessment? And then last, uh, I've got some kind of outputs that I can share with you um, that we've kind of pulled from some past uh, clients that, that have been willing to share it just in a more generic capacity. Um, so I've got a few, you know, performance metrics and some qualitative analysis that I can kind of show you that have come out of some past assessments. And then at the end, I'll, I'll obviously uh, open it up to any questions if, if there are any. You know, I, I, I'll have to throw in a bit of a disclaimer here. Unlike most of the OnTrax webcasts, this particular webcast is not product specific, i.e. Maximo specific, where we teach you about an application or a function in Maximo, but rather the process that we follow for assessment. So this is an on-track service offering and assessment, but I also think that you can do this internally, and I'll cover more on that later. But the bottom line is I've done what I can to try to make this, you know, not salesy and more educational, but um, it, it could be perceived otherwise. So I, I guess <laughs> you've, you've been warned. <laughs> So I'll kind of jump into the, you know, what is an assessment? Um, you know, the formal definition of an assessment, it's the process of making a judgment or forming, a, forming an opinion after considering something or someone carefully. And I like this definition, and in particular, I really like the, the word process, because I, I think that's an important piece here. The assessment, it's not a document, it's not an opinion, it's not a listing of opportunities. It's a formal process that has several of those components and may result in some of those things, but the assessment itself is truly a process, okay? Maybe more specifically, and I, you know, this is obviously what I think the group is most interested in, what's a maximal assessment? And I'll kind of break the maximal assessment into kind of three high-level components. The first being a comprehensive review, and I think that's the key of a maximal assessment, is going through in detail and reviewing many or all of the items that I've listed here. And of course, you could add some depending on your, you know, your environment, your company, your implementation, et cetera. Or you could remove some that may not be of interest. But things like understanding the configurations and versions that you're using and whether there's any opportunities there. You know, detailed reviews of data and data management. I'm going to go through these as, as the uh, presentation here progresses. But you know, reviewing in detail data and the data management uh, processes that are in place. The overall transactional processes, right? How do you manage work orders? How do you manage purchase acquisitions, purchase orders, inventory, and so forth? Uh, maybe some specific scenarios you're trying to get out of an assessment. We have several companies that come to us and say, hey, you know, we want a maximal assessment, but we really want it focused on this, right? So you can obviously come up with some specific scenarios or specific areas of investigation based on that. Um, customizations is a big part, particularly if you're looking to upgrade. Can we collapse some customizations? Are there other ways to do this, uh, you know, without pr providing or, or performing a formal uh, extension of our Java classes, right? Maybe there's, there's new tools now available or, or new options to maybe collapse some of them. Overall functionality, support, uh, the business rules that you apply to your system, performance metrics, infrastructure, integrations and training. So there's a huge list here, obviously. And again, I'll, I'll drill into some of these as I move through the presentation. But the, the, the point is one of the most important parts here is that comprehensive review. So coming up with those areas of investigation and in detail and systematically going through and covering each of those items. The second piece is it's a detailed list of recommended improvements. So what comes out of that review and out of that analysis is a list of opportunities for improvement, right? So you need to have that list. It, should be ranked, and I'll cover that a little bit later so that you understand, you know, what's the cost, what's the value, what's the complexity. But again, obviously you need a list of improvements to provide any long-term value or any long-term business benefits. And then uh, last, a plan forward. So typically from those list of areas of opportunity or improvements, 
you know, a company would probably select some that maybe meet their specific criteria. Um, you know, they obviously have, you know, uh, certain constraints in an organization. But, you know, typically you would identify one or many of them and say, hey, you know, this is something that we're looking to change. You know, whether it's internally changed or externally, that doesn't matter. Uh, but a plan forward should be a part of that assessment, right? Just understanding what's the plan forward, what's the, the call to action after this thing has been completed. Now, maybe I'll cover, and, and I think this will add a little bit of color to, to what an assessment is, but what it shouldn't be, or, you know, at least in, in my opinion, I guess, you know, your mileage may vary a little bit, but um, an assessment should not be a veiled project that's intended to point blame at a, you know, specific individual uh, or, or even departments. And this, this happens, you know, it's, it's not uncommon for people to come and say, hey, you know, uh, we don't think the operations group is using it maximum effectively. We want you to come and audit them, right? Well, that's probably not a good use of an assessment. I mean, assessment should be forward-looking. It should be looking for opportunities of improvement. It should be looking for... And obviously, some of those root causes may lie in a variety of different areas, but the project itself shouldn't be just intended to point blame, right? And I, I put in there, you know, individuals, departments, that's easy. Um, you know, but projects performed in the past as well, right? I mean, I mean, there's, you know, it's not a post-mortem. It's not there to go out and take a look at a project and figure out all the deficiencies in executing that project. You know, the assessment should be, again, forward-looking, what opportunities are there. And also not to point blame at past service providers or implementers, uh, you know, of the system or, or integrators or DBAs or whatever it might be. It also shouldn't be just solely a means to generate additional services or projects, and, and I guess that's maybe a warning for the vendors that do provide these services. Um, but, you know, you, don't, you wouldn't just hire, you know, a, a tradesperson and say, hey, walk through my house and tell me what, you know, what you want to do to it, right? You, you would typically have, and I, I put the word solely there, that's obviously an important component, but, you know, you don't want to just have someone come in carte blanche and identify here's everything you need to do. You need to have a focal area. You obviously need to be involved and communicating, you know, constantly through that assessment process, and I think that will manage it, but it shouldn't just be about, addition, you know, generating more work or generating more projects. Obviously, it should be about finding the business benefits and the value that's there for your company, and then, you know, executing based on that list. I, I don't think an assessment should be many, many weeks of effort, uh, and I put an asterisk there because there's obviously some factors that may change this. Obviously, if your company is very geographically dispersed, or there's many site trips that are involved, or, you know, you have a very, very, you know, large implementation, multiple versions, whatever it is, it, it is possible to be many weeks. But the real point I'm trying to make there is that with an, with an assessment, you very quickly get to that point of diminishing returns where, you know, when you talk to people and you look through the data and you go through all that analysis, you know, in the first couple of weeks, you're going to figure out 95% of the major opportunities. You can spend 10 more weeks analyzing it, but, you know, the overall cost benefit's just really not there. And, and to go back to that, you know, a, a house analogy, you know, if, if you had a home inspection and they spent five hours, you know, you'd probably find 90, 95% of items. If they spent another 10 days there, you know, that list is going to get diminishing or the, the returns will be diminished based on, you know, the extra effort. So really just trying to say that, you know, you, you'll figure most of it out in the first couple of weeks and then everything else. Again, if you needed to really drill into it, it might make sense, but in most cases you don't need to. It shouldn't just be a documentation exercise. And, and really what I'm trying to say here is there needs to be a balance between analysis and documentation. So you don't want a scenario where you spend two days analyzing and 20 days documenting, right? The documentation exercise is simply too large. That ratio is just out of whack. So again, you know, obviously you need a document out of this and you need to have, you know, an assessment report and a plan forward and all that good stuff, but you don't want to turn it into a documentation exercise where, you know, it turns into 100 pages that, you know, a lot of people aren't ever going to read other than looking at some tables and graphs and so forth. You need to kind of keep it focused on the analysis components and those list of opportunities. And it also it shouldn't be a project planning session where you get into details on planning out the projects and who's going to do it and when and how that's going to fit into the overall timelines. You know, it's not a, a roadmap to say, well, here's our maximum is today, here's where it will be in the future. And it's not a financial review on, you know, can we do it or, or, you know, even on a past project, did it make sense financially? And those may all be very valuable activities. They might be inputs to the assessment. They may be outputs to the assessment. But again, the assessment, you know, at least in my opinion, is 
is focused on the analysis and the opportunities and the plan forward. And uh, they can quickly get derailed if you start getting into detailed project planning type sessions. Uh, does it, you know, assessment need to be externally performed? And, and the answer is no. You don't need to have, you know, a company come in and, and do that, right? You could do it internally. A lot of companies already have, you know, auditing groups. And I'll, I'll call an assessment, you know, obviously it's a lighter version than a detailed audit. But you could have, you know, internal teams do this. And I just put a bit of a caution there that, you know, of course that assessment team, they shouldn't be biased, right? So obviously... You know, you probably don't want to get your maximal administrator to perform your maximal assessment. I mean, that's probably a little bit too close. You know, they should be skilled at analyzing processes and data, right? So have the ability to look through data for trends, have the ability to look at processes and, and you know, understand gaps in processes and so forth. They should be knowledgeable on leading practices. What are other companies doing? So you, you probably don't want to take someone who's only ever worked for one company and has been kind of siloed because they probably wouldn't be aware of some of those leading practices. So you'd probably want someone that, you know, had an opportunity to see many different, uh, you know, if it's a maximal implementation, many different implementations, um, or at least is, you know, has a very solid understanding of leading practices from a process perspective. You know, they should probably be strong communicators. A big component uh, of an assessment is, um, you know, interviews and obviously pulling information from individuals. They need to have good communication skills. I already mentioned arm length, arm's length a little bit from unbiased, but, you know, and I put from the content. They don't have to be arm's length from your company, but, you know, they don't, you don't want to grab someone who's too close to the content um, to, ass to, to, to perform that assessment. And then a last, of course, you know, obviously respected in the organization. So by all means, an assessment can be, performed internally with internal, internal resources, you'd probably just want to keep those elements in mind. Why performing an assessment? And I, I think I've probably covered most of this already, but you know, you'd probably, you know, the reasons, there's two main reasons you'd want to perform an assessment. One is, again, to go through that systematic review, analyze progress, areas for improvement and business benefits, and then two, to develop a plan forward. So in short, it's the reason you would do this is to continuously improve, right? Peter Drucker once said, you know, you can't manage what you don't measure, and that kind of falls into this, right, where obviously once you start measuring it, once you start looking at it, you can better manage it. And then, again, that uh, plan forward that's produced should be based on, you know, that overall improvement and uh, the areas that you've picked. So I'm going to kind of move to the, these types of assessments. So these are ones that OnTrax offers. Of course, you could change them, you know, you could flavor them for your own company. But just to give you an idea of kind of some of the areas that we typically assess, the top two are really system-centric and the bottom two are very process-centric. So a maximal assessment, I'll drill into this a little bit more, but that one's a, a more comprehensive review of the maximal system, data, and the ancillary processes around it. So it kind of covers a narrow band across all three. We're going to look at the system. We're going to look at your data. We're going to look at your work management, material, and procurement processes, uh, performance metrics, customization, support, admin, you know, it kind of covers pretty much everything that's touching maximal at a, at a certain level. And again, you know, as I mentioned previously, you know, there's probably not a lot of value in doing that for three weeks consecutively. You'd probably find a lot of those opportunities earlier on. But um, again, it's kind of a narrow band across everything that's, you know, maximal related. To the right of that is a, is a, a maximal upgrade assessment. And that upgrade assessment, it it's intended to really look at the, you know, obviously you'd only do this if you're on an older version of Maximo, but let's say you're on, you know, 7.5, 7.1, version 6, whatever it might be. It would be an assessment to document your current usage of the system, the return on investment to upgrade. You'd probably look at things like, you know, infrastructure requirements, training requirements, customizations that you have in place that you can replace or con major configurations that maybe can be better leveraged with new versions. And then most of our upgrade assessments also include a trial upgrade component. And what that is, is we actually take the database and we actually run it through the upgrade scripts and produce a trial upgrade report, which will show you, you know, the technical path needed to upgrade. So here's the deficiencies that we've identified that will need to be addressed as part of that uh, upgrade assessment. So really, obviously, very focused on, hey, I'm on this version. I want to get into that version. I need a plan forward to get there. I want to understand opportunities along the way. And then again, you may also do a trial upgrade as part of that to actually move the database through the upgrade process and get, you know, a formalized report as to, you know, what, what deficiencies, problems, customizations, et cetera, are there. Again, the bottom two are very process-centric. So, you know, a maintenance assessment, this is where we really focus more energy 
on the maintenance and work management processes, right? So we'd really spend a lot of time understanding how do you identify work? How do you plan work? How do you schedule work? How do you assign work? How do you execute work? What kind of KPIs and performance metrics do you have in place? What kind of performance improvement plans do you have in place? All of that stuff, everything kind of surrounding the maintenance process. And inventory and procurement, and you could do one or the other or both, but same, same concept, right? How do you source your, your services, materials, and parts? How do you order them? How do you store them? How do you control them? How do you use them? What do those processes look like? How do they compare to industry best practices? You know, looking at stocking strategies, obsolescence uh, management, you know, managing parts that, you know, could potentially be obsolete, how you reorder, how you stage. So essentially really focusing on the, you know, processes that exist inside of inventory and procurement. And again, these are the four that we most commonly see, but of course you could, you know, build your own flavor based on your interest. So the maximal assessment itself um, and, and again, I'm going to just drill into that one because that's for sure the most common one that we see out there. But of course, you could build it however you need. And just kind of starting bottom to top, and I think I've touched on most of these, but what we actually touch on are obviously records, right? And a key component of, of assessments for us is data. Really spend the time, look at the data, understand the data. So if you're going to go, you know, look at work orders, you know, maintenance and inventory, we'll make sure you go through and understand the tables that are there, look through the data, understand histories, understand KPIs, uh, understand what that data can tell you about the overall process. You know, we've had many scenarios where someone tells us, you know, this is how we do it, or they tell us we don't do that, and then we look at the data and it actually counters that point. So it really is an important part. Uh, you know, work instructions is something that you'll want to look at. You know, everything from training documents to maintenance procedures to maintenance improvement plans to reliability plans. What are some of the work instructions that are there? Procedures and processes, you'd want to spend a lot of time understanding the, the processes. It, I, you know, it says your work management, inventory, and purchasing, but, you know, that can be extended to, you know, include incident management, management of change, depending on what applications you're using in Maximo, but understanding the work processes. You know, you'd really want to spend some time going through the organization as well. I mean, that changes a lot. Um, you know, do you have formalized maintenance planners and schedulers and coordinators and form, and how does everything flow? Do you have buyers? Do you have a manned warehouse or an unmanned warehouse? So there's a lot of things that you'd want to understand organizationally that would help you understand how Maximo could fit into your environment. And last, obviously, just really understanding the vision and mission of the company. Like, is the system fulfilling some of that you know, vision statement for your corporation? What are some of the policies that are in place? What kind of KPIs should you be generating? Uh, you know, what are some of the deliverables? And this slide has a bit more of a, you know, a, a, a shopping list, but it, you know, again, some of the specifics, you know, you'd really, and, and the, the top three in this list really make up probably, you know, 60 or 70% of that analysis effort, but really spending time interviewing key stakeholders. So you would want to talk to, if it's maintenance, you know, everyone from the technicians to the foreman, coordinator, planner, scheduler, uh, all the way up to project sponsors and program managers. On the inventory side, again, you'd want to understand what the warehouse is doing. So talk to some of the folks in the warehouse, warehouse managers, procurement folks, people who run the reorder routine, all the way up into, you know, the procurement manager and project managers there as well. So you'd really want to spend the time making sure that you talk to all of those people, understand what some of their objectives are, and then obviously correlate that back to what their system is doing. Um, business processes is a big part. Um, if you have them documented, that makes it that much easier. But even if you don't, through those interviews, you could probably start to get a pretty good flavor of it. But again, back to really understanding what that transactional process looks like. How does it flow? How does a PR become, you know, a PO become an invoice or a receipt become an invoice? Like, how does that process move? How does the work order go from identification all the way to completion? So spend a lot of time really understanding those transactional processes and, again, comparing them to leading practices. Um, three, you know, data, data, data. This is a big thing for us. We really spend a lot of time trying to look at the data, pull a lot of performance metrics. Um, I think that helps drive a lot, you know, not only of the um, opportunities that are identified, but I think it also helps solidify a lot of opinions that are out there. So. You know, it, it, it's nice to kind of say, okay, well, you are or you're not using the system for planning. You, you have a bunch of priorities on your work orders, but frankly, you know, based on what we see from a scheduling perspective, you treat a high priority the same as you treat a low priority. So you can kind of look through that data and you can learn a lot about system usage. Uh, and again, some of those KPIs that you'd produce as part of the assessment would, would often be, um, you know, would, would result in some type of project or change that you would hope to better improve or to improve upon. I talked about org charts, you want to look at that. KPIs, any forms and reports that are out there. 
Number seven is, is one that I, you know, not everyone has them, but a lot of companies, and, and I think a lot of people are moving there, are building, you know, business rules, documents, guidance documents, governance documents, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, a, a formal document on here's how we plan to use our system. Okay, here's how we're going to create assets. Here's how we're going to number them. Here's how we're going to name them. Here's the specifications we're going to have. Here's how we're going to structure our location hierarchy. Here's um, how we're going to use work types and priorities and failure codes and so forth. So a lot of people are starting to build some of those documents. So obviously, if you have a document like that, it's extremely valuable as part of this process to be able to say, okay, well, here's what you said you would do, and here's now when we look at the system what you're actually doing, and hopefully, of course, there's no misalignment. You know, understanding the training materials, how are end users trained? Um, you know, often you know, when you talk to end, end users of the system, they always go ahead and get trained on it. But, you know, sometimes you have to go back and take a look at the training materials to figure out if it was actually in there. Company initiatives, improvement plans, migration plans and processes. How does the system move from dev to test to prod or whatever your environments are? How do you do some of that? What integrations do you have in place with other systems? Maybe there's some opportunities there. Again, comparing that to leading practices and then kind of your overall infrastructure. I mean, is it clustered environment, how many users do you have, how many transactions do you have, maybe there's some opportunities there as well. So this is kind of that assessment process put in a more linear form, and, and I kind of broke it into, you know, four big areas, but, you know, up front, obviously, you'd define the scope, you'd review any documentation that's available, you'd meet with the subject matter experts and, sharehold, uh, and stakeholders, uh, you'd go through your data analysis, compile KPIs, have some type of confirmation or I call them an affirmation session to make sure that what you captured is accurate. You draft a report, go through any clarifications, and then develop a final report. So it kind of just shows you here's a typical path. And to give you a sense, and, and obviously, you know, not every assessment is the same, but, you know, for a single site, a typical assessment is probably looking like two to three days of interviews, kind of back-to-back -back interviews with a lot of the key stakeholders we talked about probably two days of data analysis, so really pulling, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, SQL queries that we just run to, to pull out that data and put them into KPIs that we can then compile as part of our assessment report, and then maybe three to four days of kind of documenting that uh, as well as building that plan forward. So it probably sits at about seven to nine days. Again, if you had many sites, that changes if you have, you know, specific areas that are maybe more complex, then obviously that can change. But just to give you a flavor, it's not, you know, a many, many month type, uh, type project. So let me uh, maybe transition a bit to some of the typical outputs that you see as part of a, an assessment. Um, so maybe I'll start with the system one first. So we typically do a bit of a system view. Um, so on the left-hand side, you'll see that's a list of the maximal modules um, that are available. And again, that would be based on a version that a cu customer is on. So if they're on an older version, it would obviously uh, be different than a newer version. And if they have industry solutions, that changes and so forth. And then what we do is we kind of look at the capability. and and we say the capability of the system to meet the customer's intended function in that area, right? So if, if you're not at all, you know, if you, if you have very basic, you know, contract requirements, maybe the capabilities would, of course, change, um, and, and you obviously wouldn't need a ton of capabilities regardless of what the system has. Maybe you need a ton of contract management capabilities, and maybe that's outside of the scope of Maximo. Well, then there's going to be a bit of a gap. Um, what's been enabled, i.e., like, what are you actually, like, what have you actually enabled in the system? Is it usable? Is it able to be used and enabled for the people? And then, more importantly, is it actually being used? So you can have the capabilities, you know, and, and have that as green, and the usage is red because no one's, frankly, using it. So we kind of look at just a very high level, you know, what's the capability, what's been enabled, and what's been used. And, you can see the kind of scale at the bottom that we use, but, you know, more than 80%, 40 to 79, and less than 40. And obviously, it's a bit, you know, subjective, but, you know, it's, it's kind of just a bit of a snapshot on here's how you're using it, right? It has the capabilities in this case for PMs, but not all of it's enabled. You're probably not using it all, um, and it may not be, you know, uh, you may not have even enabled everything. You may not be using meter-based PMs, for example, here. So it just gives you a bit of a snapshot at a high level. I've got a slide here with some of the qualitative items, so and, and I'll go into some more quantitative here in a second. But, you know, obviously what comes out of this is a lot of qualitative type statements that, of course, have detail behind them. So I just tried to capture some of these. This is from a, a previous assessment for a company that was willing to share it. But, you know, for, for example, some of the high-level findings there for maintenance, like there weren't failure codes being used. So they weren't even using failure codes. Well, 
if you look at leading practices, that's something that should be in place. Um, the second one, they had condition monitoring points, so they were capturing condition monitoring measurement points, but then what they were doing is they were manually reviewing them, and then someone was generating work orders. Well, why don't we just enable that functionality and have the system auto-generate those work orders for you? Uh, you know, generally, uh, your work order plan materials, they had a quantity of zero. So th they had a planner that would go through, they would take a work order, they would put, here's all the, you know, parts and materials that you need to do the job, but they would put the quantity to zero, and they did that because they didn't really understand the maximal um, reservation process and had a tough time kind of managing it, so they just put it all to zero, and then, um, you know, don't have to worry about maximal generating reservations. Um, and as a result, there was no notification sent to the warehouse. They had a manned warehouse. There was no notification that these parts are going to be needed for this upcoming maintenance. So there was a real big disconnect between maintenance and materials. You know, direct issue items weren't being used on work orders. Uh, they weren't using many uh, meter-based PMs. And then some of the things they were doing quite well, like their calendars and available backlogs are, were actually managed quite well. So they really did a good job of managing crews and schedules and backlogs and doing some of those assignments. Um, the standing work orders that they were using were, were very excessive. So if you, you know, at first look, you went, you went, wait a minute, like almost every work order is, you know, or, or there's a ton of labor hours that are captured in our system. But when you drilled in a bit deeper, you realize there's about four standing work orders that people are just piling time into. Um, the notification process for, for notifying people was very cumbersome. Uh, they weren't using attached documents. The work order priorities had no time frames on them. So no one really knew the difference between a high priority, a medium, and a low. Like, is that one day? Is that 10 days? No one really had any of that. They had about 26 different work types, right, which is a massive lift to begin with, and most of those weren't mutually exclusive. So people had a tough time identifying which work type to select from. On the material side, you know, they had very good inventory turns, actually. So the inventory was moving over or, or turning over quickly, which is good. Uh, and the transactional volume was quite good. So, you know, that side of it was good. The, the physical count process, though, took them almost a month. So they were printing off documentation, going out there, writing it all down. They had no handheld device in place. And so then they're coming back and entering it all in item by item and then doing the maximal reconciliation process. It was very, very cumbersome. So there was a lot of opportunities there. They're, they had almost no invoice tolerance. So if a service was, a PO was out there for $1,000 and it comes in at, thousand and ten dollars they had to go through and do a complete PO revisioning process and no one really understood why so again that became an opportunity of improvement um, their obsolete parts were being managed but some of their slow moving parts when you looked at the data could still be reviewed there was still a lot of that they did do they did have a formalized process to check obsolete parts but again there was quite a few that were being missed uh, they were using RFQs um, they didn't use a lot of data defaults. They were entering a lot of the same information. There was no kidding. There was no controls in place. And this is just some samples. But obviously, these lists change entirely based on that system review. And I just try to show you that there's, in a sec, I'll go into some of the quantitative items, but there's a ton of qualitative ones, right? Ones that, you know, through interviews, through discussions, through looking at the system, through sitting with folks, we come up with and document. And then behind these, obviously, some of the dialogue as to, what's happening and why that may be an area for improvement. Some of the, you know, quantitative um, outputs, and I've put some here, and again, these, these have been pulled from a, uh, you know, from a, a client um, assessment. But, you know, we look at obviously like a work order backlog. What does that look like? That tells us a lot about, you know, how quickly they get entered to how quickly they actually move out to, uh, you know, being assigned and executed. Um, we look at things like PMs, days early and late. I mean, if you have PM schedules and you're always consistently early, you know, you might be spending more on maintenance than you need to be, right? If you're finishing at a month early every time, why not leave it out to that appropriate schedule? And, and on the other side of that fence, of course, is if it's late, right? If, you know, if you're consistently late on your PMs, I guess there could be compliance implications, but if, let's assume it's not compliance related, there's probably increased degradation on your assets, right? Because, you know, you have that PM schedule in place. If the frequency is not right, well, you should adjust that, but you shouldn't be consistently doing them late. Um, you know, we pull out things like mean time between failures for, you know, top 10 bad actors. So, that was something that this client was able to track. They were tracking some of that inf information. They were putting their failures in. Let's pull some of that stuff out. Um, the average work orders that are being generated in a given day, how many of those work orders have labor hours on them, 
right? So if, you know, you have, uh, here's the available labor, this is what you should be doing. And basically this client was at 94% of their time was actually going to work orders, which again was very, very good. But again, this client was also heavily using standing work orders to kind of fill that gap. So there's a, a bit of a catch on that side. So sometimes the numbers don't give you the full picture. Um, you know, uh, blanket, and then here shows kind of the blanket hours. So the percentage of blanket hours to total hours, this is back to my point that 31% of their time was actually sitting on standing work orders or blanket work orders as they're calling them. You know, how many work orders have job plans, right? That's a, a very, very easy metric to pull out. You know, taking a look at failure reporting on those work orders. How many failure, uh, how many of these work orders have problems, causes, and remedies, right? so that you can start tracking, you know, uh, and, and performing some of the reliability functions like, you know, root cause failure analysis, for example. Um, PM compliance and follow-up, right? What percentage of your PMs are actually complying with their scheduled start or with their uh, PM due dates? And then also importantly, how many of these PMs have follow-up work orders? You don't want to be consistently inspecting things, maybe compliance aside, but you don't want to always inspect things and never find anything wrong because, in that case, maybe you should elongate that um, PM frequency so that, you know, you're not doing it as often. And, you know, from a, a procurement inventory perspective, here's some of And again, there's more than this that we pull. It all depends on the customer, the data that they're ca capturing and so forth. But this particular customer had $4.6 million sitting in their inventory in their warehouse that was over its max value. So their inventory, they were going in and putting in min-max values on their inventory but they had 4.6 million worth of inventory that's sitting above its max. So someone has consciously decided that here's the maximum I want to keep on my shelf, and they're holding $4.6 million more than that in their warehouse, right? Again, maybe there's an opportunity there. Why did that happen? You'd have to drill into some of that. You know, potentially obsolete parts. You know, this customer had a large amount of uh, obsolete parts that are sitting out there. And, and when we look at obsolescence, we typically try to say, well, you know, it probably has to be over $100 the part, or we probably don't care too much about it, like consumables and stuff like that. They don't usually amount to much. And then even what we'll typically do is say there needs to be more than one on the shelf. And the reason we do that is say, well, maybe it's a critical part. If it's very critical, then fine. But if it's not moving and there's six of them on the shelf, that's probably a different scenario. And again, you still have to go in and understand the part, et cetera but it gives you that list to start working with to move forward and say, hey, is this obsolete or is it not? For this particular company, their inventory turns were quite good. They had three, they were turning over their inventory value about three times in a year, which is actually very good. And in their industry, that was, you know, the, the leading practice was about 3.5. So that, that was quite good. And obviously that changes uh, drastically based on how remote your locations are, how close you are to major, you know, distributors and so forth. So obviously all of those elements need to be considered when you compare to any you know, best practice number out there. Uh, inventory age, right? Looking at the age of items, how long have they been sitting on the shelves, right? And again, that points to some of the obsolete parts. PO values was an interesting one. Looking at POs, and in this particular company, they had 618 POs that were less than $125 for the PO. And kind of an industry, and it, you know, you'll see different numbers between $125 and $250 is what they say is the cost of transacting the PO. So when someone sits down and writes a PR and then it goes to a buyer and they consolidate it into a PO and then they send it to a vendor and then they receive it, yada, 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 you know, that costs money. And if you're buying something for $80 and spending $200 buying it, you know, you may want to consider options like procurement cards or, you know, maybe some type of vendor agreements or, or blanket agreements with some of your major suppliers to reduce that, right? So really trying to understand what are the value of some of these POs. And, and again, you know, these are just some examples. Obviously, you'd want to think, you know, what you, you know, take a look at what you are interested in. There's a lot of good metrics out there depending on the industry that you're in. Um, you know, there's a lot of good KPIs that you could take a look at. And in, in many cases, depending on your system, you have the data to support it. So just to, maybe to move to the, you know, what are the final outputs of this thing? Well, one, you'd get an assessment report. An assessment report would have the details behind kind of all those items I just went through. Um, Probably as important, it has a list of opportunities. So based on that analysis, you're going to have a list of opportunities. Maybe you should consider, you know, implementing mobile in your warehouse. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe you should upgrade to a new version. Maybe you should use this application. Maybe you should, you know, attach documents here. Whatever those opportunities are, 
And then we typically rank them by, you know, what's the value? Like, what's the overall value to the business? Like, what kind of return would you get on this? What's the cost to implement it, whether it's internal or external? But what's the cost? And then obviously, what's the complexity? You know, is it going to take, you know, many years? Do we have to get many things in place? Or is it something that's not very complex? And again, this allows you to kind of look at it and go, okay, well, I probably want everything that's got a high value, low cost, low complexity. Let's do those right away. And then from there, you can kind of work through that list based on your, you know, your funding envelopes, your, you know, flavor for risk, your ability to execute projects. And then last, you know, just a, a plan forward that is based on those agreed upon opportunities. So once you have that list of opportunities, you know, typically you would work to build that plan forward to say, well, here's what that would look like. You know, here's a specific project plan now with assigned resources that's realistic and can actually be executed given your current environment. And, you know, in closing, and, in, you, know, uh, you know, my last slide here before I open it up to questions, but, you know, your maximal implementation was a significant investment. I mean, most of you, you know, whether it was implemented internally, externally, a combination thereof, it was a substantial investment. Everything from gathering the data to building the processes and governance documents to rolling the system out and actually using it. And like many investments of that size, you should probably be doing a periodic review for areas of opportunity that allow for continuous improvement. And, you know, it's very easy to kind of get stuck in the day-to-day. The -day. You've got tickets, you've got projects, you've got... But, you know, sometimes having someone come in and take a look across and, you know, look at the whole board and identify some of those areas of uh, opportunity and, and rank them with you, um, you know, helps kind of focus, the, you know, the initiatives that are there. It's, you know, maybe no longer just the person who's, you know, the loudest gets what they want. You can actually, as a business, decide based on kind of a bigger list what, depending on your version, yeah, value to your company. Uh, we will, we have recorded this and it will be... Um, uploaded, I, I believe, I, if, I, I probably will make sure that we get the, the list on that, that's actually registered for this, um, a link to that so that you can have that. Or if you want the presented PowerPoint, uh, you can just send me an email. My contact information is on the screen there. So if you have any questions, follow-ups or anything like that, I would be happy to help you.